In Chapter 3, we're going to be exploring drawing with PaintShop Pro. We'll be following closely the PaintShop Pro 2022 Fundamentals book, which is available through Amazon. And in Chapter 3, we'll be discussing using the different paintbrush tools. We'll talk about raster versus vector objects, and then we'll create vector objects. We'll create text, and we'll add drop shadows to text. And we'll see how to modify text layers. We'll use the text cutter tool. And we'll be creating text that follows a curve line. Then we'll have some fun with picture tubes. And we'll discuss using the flood fill tool. And we'll explore adjusting gradient properties. All this will be covered in Chapter 3. Paint Shop 2022 Ultimate is now open to the Edit Workspace. We'll create a new image. And in the New Image dialog box, we'll go ahead and set the canvas size to 1024 by 768 using a raster background that's white. Transparency will be off, and we'll select OK. You may notice that the toolbar collection is slightly different. I've gone into Chapter 5 and followed the instructions on how to customize this toolbar. And I've gone from the default toolbar to a toolbar where I've added a save copy as and paste new image options, along with tools for the AI background, replacement, portrait, one-step photo fix, closing all the windows, merge all layers, select none, frame, that's picture frame, add borders, center, things horizontally and the drop shadow up and these are tools that I use fairly often and so I've customized the toolbar to include them. Let's do a quick review of the user interface. Starting with the menu bar on top where you know that you can click on these options and pull down menus. Underneath the menu bar is the toolbar and underneath that is the tool options this is a context sensitive area and it will depend on what tool has been selected. Down in the lower left corner of the display is a tool tip and each time you select a tool you'll get information on how to use that tool. So keep one eye on this tool tip area. It's very useful. In the lower right side of the display we have the image size of the current active image. In our examples, we'll be using the HSL map in the material selector area. And in this area, we can select foreground or background colors. Let's do some drawing using the brush tool. Now, the tool tip reminds me to click and drag to paint with a foreground color, right click and drag to paint with a background color. Currently, the foreground color is set to black, the background color is set to white. Let me left click and drag. Left click and drag, I'm painting with a foreground color. If I right click and drag in a white area and draw with a white brush, you won't see much. If I right click and drag, I paint white on top of whatever is there. Let me change brushes. I have a large collection of brushes because I downloaded and installed the Creative Content Pack and that included a number of new brushes to use. Let me select the round 25 brush. I can select a brush and then select OK or I can simply double click on that brush. Let me change the foreground color by left clicking in that foreground color area and then I can select Notice that it came up in grayscale because it came up with what we were starting with. I can select here and then I get the color wheel and I can choose different colors from the color wheel. OK. Now I'm drawing with a new foreground brush. Let me change the color for the background. Left click in the background color area. Click mm, how about something in the blue range. OK. Now right click background, left click foreground, right click background, and you can just switch colors 
of the paintbrush that easily. Suppose that I wanted a standard color, I could right click in my foreground area and that opens up this little palette and it includes recent materials and it includes some stock materials. If I choose red I'll get pure red 25500 as far as the RGB colors. Now I get red. Let me right click and select blue pure blue for the background. So I've got background, foreground, background, and so on. Also notice that there's a little rainbow here and I can click there and change the range of my HSL color area. Also there's a row of recently used colors here. If I change from the HSL map to swatches then I get a whole collection of stock colors that I can pick from. And there's a lot more than that. Because people have created, in addition to the standard swatch palette, they've created all kinds of different palettes, different collections of swatches to use. There's a festival of color. There are natural colors, they claim and so forth. I'm going to stick with the HSL map for the time being and I'm going to choose red, blue and I'm going to go over here and change my brush to something more interesting. Oh, um, How about this left slanting line? Now when I draw it's almost like using a calligraphy tool. If I do the right slanting line and do pretty much the same thing, you notice a so subtle difference in the tool. There are a lot of brush tools that give you little collections. For example, the clover flower. Let me select that. This has gotten a little messy, so let me control A to select all delete to delete. Whoops, remember when I delete a selection it changes to the current background color. So now if I delete I'll get white. Now let me go and choose a color for this funny clover brush. Click, click, click. This particular brush every time I click it cycles through a different size and a different shade of the basic color that I've selected. Click, 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 click. If I click and drag, it cycles through those with a particular spacing, and the spacing is set by the step size. So if I set that step size smaller, then the spacing is smaller. Oh, there's no end of experimenting to do here with all of these different brushes and different colors and so you should pause the video and just experiment with some of these different brushes and see how they work and observe for each brush observe the different characteristics step size, hardness, density and experiment with these brushes to see how they work. Right next to the paintbrush tool we have the airbrush tool. Let's use the airbrush tool. I have the size set to 60. So I'll just click, click, click and drag, click and drag, so far it might not look a lot different from the regular paintbrush tool. Go back to the paintbrush tool, click and drag, click and drag, but there is a difference. Let me go back to the airbrush tool and this time let me adjust the opacity so to make this difference a little more obvious. Let me change the opacity to about 12. And now watch what happens at 
look look closely now I click and hold you notice how that changes let me click and drag notice that the longer I hold the damn more intense the color gets whereas with the paintbrush tool I click and it's there I click no change but in the airbrush tool there's a subtle difference I click and I can click lightly just a touch of the airbrush nozzle or I can lean on the airbrush nozzle and have it fill in light touch heavy touch light touch heavy touch so you can use the airbrush just the airbrush tool just as if you had an actual airbrush where you had pressure sensitive nozzle on the airbrush and the harder you press the nozzle the more intense the color gets the airbrush tools another one to experiment with so we've experimented with the paintbrush tool the airbrush tool but there's more in addition to the airbrush and paintbrush tools, we have a lot more brushes. Let's look at the oil brush tool. Now, the tooltip simply says click and drag. It doesn't say anything about foreground and background. I have my foreground set to red, so I'm going to click and drag. And the more I drag, the more I run out of paint. So I've got to dip my oil brush into the paint again, click and drag, and the farther I go, the less paint I have left on the brush, and it goes right down to the actual paper canvas, and <laughs> you can adjust that. In addition to the oil brush, we have chalk, and again it says click and drag to paint with a chalk. Aha, uh -huh. that's again the edges are feathered there in the chalk tool. What about the pastel tool? Well, let me change to a different color here. Again, it says click and drag, doesn't say anything about foreground and background. Chalk, crayon. When you draw with a crayon on top of other colors, strange things happen. And then we have colored pencil. Oh, that looks a lot like some of the others. You'll just have to play with the sizes and other characteristics. Here's a magic marker. Hmm. Once again, that's different. I need to clear this off. It's getting messy. So once again, I'm going to say select all. And remember the shortcut for selecting all is Control A. And before I press the delete key, I'm going to go back to the default colors and that'll clear it off. And now under selections, I can select none. Remember the shortcut for selecting none is Control D. Okay, where were we? We were painting with some red color or maybe some other color and we're going to try the watercolor brush what happens if I change colors and paint on top of other colors Let's see what's happening with a strange watercolor brush and there's more there's a palette knife And just like the palette knife, when you go over things, it kind of starts blending the colors that were underneath. And there's also a smear tool. This smears that out, smears that out. And there's also an eraser. Just like your old pink pearl eraser, the more you erase, the more goes away. If you just erase lightly, not much goes, but you just keep rubbing harder and harder until you've cleared everything off. So, you see there's a large collection of other brushes we can use 
to paint with. Next we're going to explore the preset shape tool. And before we do that we need to discuss the difference between raster objects and vector objects. What's the difference you might ask? Well I'm glad you asked that question. When you were drawing with a paintbrush tool earlier you were creating raster images. Raster images are collections of little square areas called pixels. If you zoom in on the drawing you made with a paintbrush you will see the individual pixels. Let's see how that works. I'm going to return to the paintbrush tool and then I think I'll select well clouds. Let's do the cloud. And let me draw a little bit with the paintbrush cloud tool. Now let me zoom way in on this and you can see what's going on. The more I zoom in, the more you start to see the individual pixels. And you see the cloud tool is actually not just one solid color. The edges are shaded by gradually changing the shade of the pic individual pixels. This is a raster image. And the more I magnify it, the more I enlarge those little picture elements. Vector objects, on the other hand, use formulas rather than pixels to draw the lines and curves. This means that when they're large, they take on the resolution of the display or the printer. If you enlarge a curved raster object to the size of a billboard, the curves will be jagged. However, if you enlarge a vector object to the size of a billboard, the curve lines would be smooth. Remember that when we used the paintbrush tool, we were creating raster objects, but when we use the preset shape tool and there are a number of options in the preset shape area when we use the preset shape tool we'll be creating vector objects when I select the preset shape tool and then click on the shape list you'll see I have a large variety of preset shapes to pick from if your collection is not this big Maybe you have not downloaded and installed the Creative Content Pack. Well, let's create an arching arrow and see what happens. To create a preset shape, we click and drag. And notice that I clicked from the upper left to the lower right. What happens if I click from the upper right to the lower left? It changes the direction. Similarly, if I click from lower left to upper right, or lower right to upper left, I get a variation of the direction of that preset shape. Let's try another preset shape. How about a pointing finger? Once I've created this preset shape, notice that there are grab points that I can use to change the size. Or the width. Or there's actually a rotation option. So I can rotate that preset shape. You have to watch the cursor to see whether it's a one-way arrow or an angled arrow or in the center a four-way arrow. When it's a four-way arrow I can drag the preset shape around. If I use the pick tool I can select a preset shape and related to the preset shape are the rectangle, the ellipse, and the symmetrical shape tools. Let's try the rectangle and we can draw one out or notice that, that I'm changing both the height and the width when I drag that. If I hold the shift key down while I drag it, it forces it to be a square. A similar thing happens with the ellipse tool. 
click and drag or if I hold the shift key down and click and drag I get a perfect circle which is a form of an ellipse one more we have the symmetrical shapes and click and drag a symmetrical shape and in the context toolbar we can choose the number of sides for this shape six maybe even nine so you see there are a lot of preset shapes now I'm going to use the pick tool and I'm going to select one of these remember when you create preset shapes they go on to a vector layer as opposed to a raster layer if I double click on a preset shape it will open the vector property dialog box and I have control over the stroke right now the stroke width is one watch what happens if I make it two you see that the stroke is actually the boundary of the preset shape I can change the color of the stroke as well as the size I can change the line style of the preset shape There are some strange things you can do with line style. You can also select a fill for the preset shape. Right now the fill is white. If I click here, I get into the material properties color selector and I can select a new color for the preset shape. OK let's try another let me use the pick tool and pick this preset shape double click adjust the stroke width a little bit select fill this time instead of using the color material let me select the gradient fill and I'll select this aqua hues and let me move away from this so we can see what's happening say OK and you see that that preset shape has been filled now with a gradient fill. Gradient fills will be covered in more detail in a later session, but right now you might notice that we can invert the fill. Notice that this was shaded from dark to light. If I invert that fill, it switches from light to dark. I can also use a linear fill, a rectangular fill, a sunburst fill, or a radial fill. Let's leave that alone and let me pick this elliptical preset shape down here. Expand it just a little bit double click I like to increase the stro stroke width in this example just so it's a little more dramatic click on fill select gradient this time I'll select the blossom and the sunburst and I'm going to invert it and say OK and you see the effect that has let's do another we'll scroll down here and look at the variety there are so many variations of gradient fills let's go to the sunburst and notice I can actually move the spot the center of that sunburst and I can do it by dragging this or I can do it by controlling these things well enough for now so we have preset shapes of quite a variety of preset shapes. When preset shapes are created, they create vector layers. We still have the background layer. If I select the background layer and then I select the flood fill tool and choose a new flood fill, let me just choose a color. How about a light blue color 
Okay, now when I flood fill, you see it's filling everything in the background layer. And that's independent of the preset shapes. If I go back to the pick tool and I decide I want to select this pointing finger and move it, I'm moving that vector layer. I'm not affecting the, the background that was filled. So the preset shapes give you a lot of things to work on. The next tool to explore is the text tool. Let me go ahead and open a new canvas and I'll make it 1024 by 768 again. And then I'll select the text tool and when that's selected the context toolbar opens up and gives me a lot of choices for setting text parameters. Let me just select the current parameters and I'll just click somewhere and enter some text. Once I have text in place and the text tool is still active, I can edit that text. I can use the double click trick to select one word or I can use Control A to select all the text. Notice that the text is white with a black stroke color. I can actually change the font color for the text here. And that's the same as the background color. So the font color in text uses a background color for fill and it uses the foreground color for the stroke color. And just like with preset shapes, I can change the stroke width. And when I'm happy with the text, I'll select Apply. Now this has created a vector layer, and when that text in that vector layer has been selected, I could use the grab points, and I could adjust the sizes just the same as with the preset shape vector layers. I can also rotate, I can also drag, move it around, and again with the text tool selected and I could select just one letter and I could change its color and I could change its size. And I could change the font style. And I could apply the changes, move the text around, and as you can see, you can edit this text by selecting one letter at a time, a word at a time, or the entire text, and you can change the font color, you can change the stroke color, you can change the stroke width, you can make it bold, you can make it italic, you have all of these capabilities of adjusting your text. There are a lot of times when I want this text to stand out from the background and I'll usually add a drop shadow for that. Let me create some more text here first. Now the system remembered the stroke width that I was using before, I changed the font. Let me select all the text and reduce the stroke width a little bit and apply those changes. And now let me add a drop shadow. I'm going to go to the menu bar and select Effects, 3D Effects, Drop Shadow. And that opens up the Drop Shadow dialog box. And right now, the offset's set to 10 vertical, horizontal. I'm going to change these. If I have Preview on Image toggled on, you'll see the results as I adjust things. 
let's just change this to 4 by 4 opacity. I'm going to make it 90. And the blur, I think I'll make that 4 also. And you can see the effect of that. If you select this arrow, you'll see a list of preset drop shadow options. In my case, I've decided I may want to use these settings on other text. I'm going to click on the little disk tool here and create a name for this shadow and say OK. And then I'll say OK to add this drop shadow. If later on I'm creating new text, let me just create it with a different font. Apply that. If I select the drop shadow tool that I've added to my customized toolbar, I get tired of pulling down effects and so on. The system remembers the last drop shadow settings that were used but I can go to the list and go back to the default drop shadow settings. Adding drop shadows to text is a useful option to have available. Now just as a reminder, when we create text and activate it, that's actually created a new vector layer there are a lot of things we can do with vector layers. But for this example, I'm going to clear everything off and I'm going to go to the sample image book and then I'm going to find a cloud image, select it, right click copy, alt tab back to paint shop, and then I'm going to paste that as a new image and that's a raster image named background. Let me add text to this clouds background image. I've selected the Arial font with a size of 200, bold, red, alignment centered, stroke width 2, stroke color black, and I've set the caps lock key on so that I can just create some big text here. and then I'll say accept that. Well for for the purposes of this illustration I think I'll drag this out to be even bigger. And with this text selected I can go to the effects 3D effects and I can experiment with the 3D effects. There's a chisel effect There's a cutout effect, and you can change the color of these things, and the shadow color, sizes, cancel that one. Let's look at another 3D effect, drop shadow, well we've experimented with that before. The other 3D effect is the inner bevel, and I'll drag this out of the way. And you see in the settings area, you can choose from a variety of different bevel styles. Now each time you choose one of these, by the way, you'll have to wait for the preview on image to catch up. It takes a little bit on some of these bevel styles before you actually see the change. Okay, I'm going to cancel out of that. And now, instead of using the 3D effects options, I'm going to right click on the vector layer and select properties. The properties dialog box again gives me the option to preview on the image. Right now it says blend mode normal. If I would select the overlay blend mode, you see what happens. You can see the clouds through here. Actually the background color that this is overlaid on has an effect on the shading of the text itself. I'm going to go back to normal and then I'm going to look at the layer styles tab. Layer is selected. 
let's just take a quick tour of the different layer styles option. There's reflection. Turn that off. There's an outer glow and we can change the color of the outer glow. We can change the size of the outer glow. We can bevel and again we can change the size and the opacity of the bevel and we can change the color of the bevel. There's an emboss option. There's an inner glow option. And I'm just going to stick with the bevel option for now. Say OK. With the text selected, you see we have these grab points as normal. I can select a grab point. I can drag. I can select the center grab point move it around but now there's some new tricks that we can use with these drag points if I hold the control key down notice that the grab points now have gone away except for the corner points watch what happens when I drag this to the left oh in a galaxy far away I'm going to undo that hold the control key down, this time I'm going to drag that vertically. Interesting. Undo, hold the control key down, hold the control key down with this one. So there's all kinds of variations now that we can do with a resizing tool with the grab points if we hold the control key down. If we hold the shift key down we get different options. Move that to the left, undo, shift key down, move that to the right, undo, shift key down, and you can play with these and see what kind of variations you have when you hold the shift key down as opposed to holding the control key down. There are a lot of adjustments you can make when you create text and you have it on a separate layer and you look at the properties and all kinds of interesting things can happen. Also, when you have text selected, by using a combination of the control key with the grab points or the shift key with the grab points, you can adjust the text in different ways. Another useful text tool is the text cutter tool. To demonstrate that, I'm going to close this window, go back to my sample book, scroll down until I find this tulips picture, select it, right click, copy the image, alt tab back to PaintShop Pro, and then paste as new image. And now that I have the tulip image, I'm going to add some text, but I'm going to adjust the text characteristics a little bit. For this example, I'd like to use a font that has a lot of space in the interior. And on my system, I have a font called Blacksmith that works. So, enter some text. Accept that text. And I want a big example, so I'm just going to drag this around. And move it around a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to select the Text Cutter tool. And that's created a new image. Here's my original image. And when I created the Text Cutter image, it chopped a chunk out. And you notice that all the interior of that text now has been replaced by the background image. Just for fun, I'm going to add a drop shadow. 
think I have my old favorite here. And say OK. And then I'm going to copy that image. Open another blank canvas. And then I'm going to paste that image into this canvas. And there you see the text cutter image was copied and pasted onto a new image. The last text option to explore is to have text follow a curved line. So let me choose the pen tool and choose freehand. Make sure I'm creating on a vector and I have the foreground set to black, the background set to white, and now I'm just going to sketch out a line here. And then I'll go to the text tool and I have the Arial font selected at size 14 and I've turned the stroke width off now that I have a curved line, I can select the text tool. If I leave the font color to be white, I won't see much of the text. So I'm going to go over here and I'm actually going to flip between black and white. I have Arial 14, Alignment, let's put Alignment left. Now watch the text cursor when I approach this curved line. When I get right on that curved line, the cursor changes to this little curve text tool. And now I can start typing text. And the text follows the line. Let me accept that text. And I'll drag this over here. And it keeps following the curved line that I established. I created a freehand line for the text to follow, but what if I create an ellipse? And then I select the text, make sure that my font color is not white. Now I can create some text that follows the curve. So here is another tool in your text creation tool set. Let's have some fun with a picture tube tool. I've gone ahead and created a 1024 by 768 canvas and now I'll select the picture tube tool and this opens a context sensitive toolbar here. I'll just click in the selector for picture tubes. Wow, I have a lot of picture tubes installed in my system. If you've downloaded and installed the Creative Content Pack, you'll have quite a few picture tubes also. The picture tubes are divided into categories. I can pull down this list and I'll select the Animals category and then I'm going to select butterflies. I'll go out here and I'll left click, there's a butterfly. Left click again, another butterfly. There's a variety of butterflies here and right now they're randomly coming up through the collection of butterflies. If I scale this down to about 36 and then I click, I get butterflies smaller. If I click and drag, you see that it will cycle through the collection of butterflies. If you want to see how many butterflies are in this collection, you can click on the settings tool. And in the picture tube settings dialog box, it shows me that we have a total of 12 butterflies. 
arranged three across, four down, and the step size is 300. Let's change the step size just to see how that works. Let's cut it in half. Now when I click and drag, the butterflies are going to be closer together. Let me select a different picture tube tool. I'm going to go into the artistic category and select a 3D gold. Now I'm going to click and drag and watch what happens. Oh, that's really interesting, isn't it? Well, let's open up the settings dialog box and see what's going on here. That gold picture tube, there's only one cell in the collection, and the step size has been set to 1. So when I click and drag, they fall on top of each other. If I reset the step size to, let's say, 30, let's see what happens. And now when I click and drag, you can see the spacing has changed. Well, this is getting messy, so let me clear off this canvas. Just And the way I'm going to do it is to select all, and notice that the select all, the shortcut is control A, and select none, the shortcut is control D. So now I have this whole canvas selected, and I'm going to press the delete key, and that replaces a selection not always with white. It replaces the selection with white because that's the current background color. Now, control D to deselect, and I can go back and look at some more picture tools. Let's look at nature. And here I have grass, flowers, vegetation. If I select grass, I can put in a patch of grass here and I could change the grass size if I wanted to. Let me go in and put some vegetation. Let me put in a tree right about there. That's a big old tree. I can change that scale of that tree and put another one over here. I wonder how many different trees are in this collection. I can click on the settings tool to find out. There are only three trees in this collection of trees and the step size is 500. Well, that's okay. So I can easily, if I click and drag here, I can change the scale by clicking and dragging. Now I can put some trees over here that are kind of far away. And we can play until we get tired of choosing different things. Let's put some vegetation here in the foreground. A little bit of vegetation there. We can put some animals in, and there are all kinds of things that we can select. Maybe we'll select dogs. Let's put a dog right there. Put another dog there. I wonder how many dogs are in the collection. Six different dogs. With a picture tube tool, you can create some artistic scenes without having to have a lot of artistic skills. Picture tubes, a lot of fun. In this section, we'll explore the Flood Fill tool. I've gone ahead and created a blank 1024 by 768 canvas, and now I'm going to select the Flood Fill tool. And when I select the Flood Fill tool, the hint down here says, click to fill with foreground, right click to fill with background. Well, let me choose different colors for the foreground and background. Maybe I'll go from red to blue. Now click to fill with foreground, right click to fill with background, and as easy as that you can switch between filling with foreground and background. Fill with a background of white, and let's look at another example. For this example I'm going to go back to the picture tube tool, and I'm going to select fall leaves. Let's just make a click, put a collection of fall leaves here. Let me make them larger.
you notice that each one of these leaves has a shadow, but the shadow is not solid. The shadow has a gradation here from dark to light gray. I'm going to divide this into two parts now. I'm going to use my selection tool and I'll select part of this and the flood fill tool fills the currently active selection. So let me choose a new color for the flood fill tool. Oh, kind of a light blue color here. And now let me go back and choose the flood fill tool and fill this selection. Before I do, I'm going to check out the tolerance. I want to be dramatic here. I'm going to set the tolerance to zero. And then I'll flood fill this selection. And now I'm going to select the other side. And change the flood fill tool tolerance to 100 and then flood fill this side. Okay, I'm going to deselect control D and then select nothing. And let's zoom in here and look at the difference between the flood fill tolerance at zero and the flood fill tolerance at 100. Notice with the flood fill tolerance set at zero, it doesn't fill in any of that gray area, but with it set at 100, it fills in pretty much all of that gray area. Let's look at another example. I'm going to go back to the sample book, and I'm going to scroll down until I find this butterfly image select, right click, alt tab, back to paint shop, use my paste as new image tool, and now I'm going to experiment with the different tolerances with this image. Let me start with a tolerance of zero, fill this area. You can see it doesn't well, if I zoom in here, you can see what's going on. These lines are not dark lines. They're, they're lines that have a shaded edge. And with the tolerance set to zero, we don't get much of that shaded edge. If I set the tolerance to 10, pick the same cell on the other side of the butterfly, you see we get a lot more of it. If I set the tolerance to 20, picks up even more of that area. If I set the tolerance to 30, oops, it leaked out and it filled right across there. Let me undo that and zoom in and see what's going on. You see that this line, which is not solid black, but sort of gray fuzzy, it does have some gray area in here, but with a flood fill tolerance set at 30, it goes right past that and leaks out. If I'd set the tolerance back to zero, you see that it doesn't even get close to leaking out. So the effect of the flood fill tolerance makes a big difference in how things get filled. Now, I don't have to fill with solid colors. I could select a gradient fill and say OK. And now I've filled with a gradient with the tolerance set at zero. Let's back up, set the tolerance at 20, fill this background area a little nicer. In the next section, we're going to talk a lot more about how to control gradients.
It's time now to explore the gradient fills option. So let me go here in the foreground area and select the gradient material properties. In the gradient material properties area, I'm going to select aqua hues. And then let me go ahead and say OK. And let's fill this. And you see it has a nice gradient going from light to dark. Let me select a box out of this. And delete that so that I have a, a white selected area now. Let me go back to the gradient fill tool. And this time I'm going to toggle the invert option. And go back to the flood fill tool. And you see what happens. Now it's inverted the direction. Let me make another selection here. And delete what's inside that selection. Go back to the flood fill tool. Open up the gradient fill tool again. We can have linear, we can have rectangular, we can have a sunburst, or we can have a radial. If we go to the sunburst, you notice that we can change the center point. The horizontal and vertical distance of the center point and we can also change the focal point. Right now the focal point is right smack in the middle, 50% this way, 50% that way. If we drag this little thing, you see that we're dragging the focal point to a different area. Let's just go ahead and fill with that, see what happens. So all kinds of things we can do. Let's open up a new blank canvas. and go back to the gradients and we'll go back to the linear and we'll just scroll down all of the different gradient fills that are available pick a fill, pick a fill, any fill you like suppose I pick this duotone now notice here that there's this bar that shows the left side being light the right side being dark and that's defining the range of this gradient fill. And then there's a center point. It's possible to move this around. Have more light, less dark. More dark, less light. When we do that, we're actually changing the gradient fill. So let's save this with a different name. Let me go ahead and say OK and fill here with the gradient fill material properties open you can choose from a variety of gradient fills you can choose the style of fill and within each style you can adjust whether it's inverted or normal you can adjust where the focal point is and where the center point is and you can make some very interesting fills. And you notice that we can limit the gradient fill to just a selected area. By the way, in the selection area, it's possible to invert the selection. So now when I delete, I clear off the outline. If I fill with that same gradient fill, I get an interesting effect. You can also use the gradient fills together with the preset shape tools. If I select one of the preset tools, for example the ellipse, and I click and drag out an ellipse, remember that that has created a new layer. These preset shape tools create vector graphics. And when I have a vector graphic on the screen, I can use the pick tool to select it and when I double click on it I can choose a fill 
and I could choose the gradient fill just to fill that shape. So with a little work, you can take a flat 2D circle and turn it into what looks like some kind of planet in space. And the Gradient Materials Properties dialog box allows a lot of variety in selecting different kinds of gradients for filling. Once you've mastered the various drawing tools available in PaintShop Pro 2022, you can combine that knowledge with your knowledge of modifying photos and techniques for enhancing images. And by combining all that knowledge, you'll soon become a PaintShop Pro 2022 master user.